opening the lecture, the most important takeaway is I used to be an ETPS tutor. So I have my rod. <laughs> if I see a student slumbering at the back, I will either stop speaking because I'm too boring or I'll give you a bit of a thwack, <laughs> depending on what seems appropriate at the time. Um, I've written three books now, a trilogy of books. I'm a prolific author as well as being a test pilot. What brought that up, you might say? Why would I do such a thing? Because as I was saying to a mate just now, it does not make me any money, I assure you of that. Um, my dad used to be in the Royal Air Force during the war. He joined in 1940 as an 18-year-old. He thought the uniform would help him pull more girls. He had a shed load, but he thought a few more wouldn't hurt, so he joined the Air Force. He was already a clerk, uh, and, and although he wanted to be air crew, they said, just be a clerk a little bit longer, we're desperately short of clerks. He was the clerk to Treble Two Squadron, which featured Douglas Bader, Hanford Tuck, a whole bunch of famous names. He then moved on to 65 Squadron and flew Mustangs. He was the clerk as they went into France immediately after uh, D-Day. They followed the front line, flying off dirt strips, supported uh, Monkey Garden, that kind of thing. He had some fascinating stories about that period. At the age of 16, he had a massive stroke, couldn't speak, couldn't write, couldn't really communicate. Swore like a trooper, but couldn't speak. So, when I turned 60, I thought, gosh, I've got grandkids, wouldn't it be a shame if they never got to hear some of my stories about being a test pilot, being in the Navy, and so on. So I sat down in COVID, like many of us did, uh, and I spoke to a few people about writing books, and the bottom line was, you don't know until you try. Um, test pilots can actually write, it's part of the key skills, you might disagree with me, some of you, but uh, it turns out you can. So I wrote that book at the top there, Test Pilot, um, it came out last year, and that book concentrates on my recent 20 years of flying. Most of it, uh, my time in the CAA, which I'll talk about if we get time at the end. I'll just check my watch, make sure I don't have run. Um, and a lot of people said when I wrote that book, since it was all about my time flying civil aircraft, where's all the military stuff? Why don't you tell us about Boston Down? Because it turns out outside our community here, that have the luxury quite often of being familiar with aviation, there's lots of people out there that are frustrated aviators that really have quite an interest in fast jets and you know, military stuff. So I answered the call and I wrote this book about my decade at Boston Air. Um, and then finally, uh, since I couldn't stop, I wrote Naval Aviator, which is due out in September. Naval Aviator, I was able to find all my confidential reports, very scary, very depressing. Turns out um, I was not a gifted pilot, which I think is quite perhaps humorous for my like, test flying that I currently do in the Boston Down. But apparently I joined the Navy not as a gifted pilot, not a natural pilot, might do better in time, that kind of thing. Uh, but I had all my reports, uh, a lot of stuff I'd written down, a lot of letters I'd written to my wife. So I had a lot of material, a lot of evidence that I could base that book on. Uh, same with test pilot. Every time I fly something as a test pilot, I write a report, even now. Uh, however short, and that's a good revenue jogger. Ironically, for my decade here, um, I had nothing. I had my logbook and nothing else. So, if I've got any of the facts wrong, forgive me. I bounced the book off half a dozen different people that I thought might know more than I did about uh, what was going on at the time. Uh, but that was the only way I could fact check my recollections and my flying logbook. That's literally all I had to go on. <clears throat> so that's me. I've been doing a bit of float plane training up in Scotland a few years ago. I make this claim in the blurb. I, it turns out as an author, you've got to sell yourself. You've got to kind of have a USP if you've watched The Apprentice and stuff like that. You've got to say something about yourself that's ideally unique. So I say, a bit like you know, Clarkson, a bit like Carlsberg Lager, you know, possibly, probably the most qualified and experienced test pilot working today. Why do I say that? Well, I'm, uh, 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 back in the day, about 10, 15 years ago, the ASA came into being. They introduced test pilot licenses. Um, I'm a test pilot for helicopters and airplanes. I'm a flight test instructor for helicopters and airplanes. Uh, I also happen to hold, I know this for a fact, the only ATPL for autogyros in Europe, probably in the world. And I happen to be a flying instructor for airplanes and helicopters and gyros. <coughs> so, so that's Putting all of that together, I think that's unique. If anybody knows anybody 
as qualified as that, let me know. Um, but my experience to date, I've been fortunate enough along the way to have flown over 400 different types. Uh, many of you will know Uncle Brown talks about 477 types in his book. Uncle Brown is incredibly modest. Uh, he writes Spitfire. You know, I mean, 20 odd variants of the Spitfire. I'm sure he flew nearly all of them. He writes Spitfire. I'm not that modest. <laughs> so, so for me, if it was a seeking and you needed a course, to learn how to fly that seeking, I, I counted. So it was a seeking four, seeking three, different types of the military, and I included the military types. So I think all of that together, I can I can boast that claim. That um, one good effort as well. Right, let me tell you just a little bit about how I got to being a test pilot. How did it all begin for me? So it turns out I used to go on holiday to a place called Aberfrown. Aberfrown's in Anglesey. Anglesey is the home of Aria Valley, and back in the day when I was in Genster, the mats were yellow. That takes me somewhat, doesn't it? So uh, I would sit on the beach, building my sandcastles, not going in, in the sea, because actually I didn't like the sea that much, but watching the mats go overhead, the yellow whirlwinds go overhead. So that sowed the seed alongside my dad's uh, enthusiasm for the variation, and ethics models, and balsa models, and rubber band power models, all of which. Uh, yeah, informed me about aviation. Uh, that and the fact that I went to a school where when I was about 10, my class, my form, was full of Biggins books, which was again, and, and, you know, I wanted to fly a sort of camera. In fact, I still do. Um, look at that handsome Hulk. <laughs> look at that guy. I sometimes wonder whether I would like to be 16 again uh, rather than 65. I, the jury's out on that. I don't think I'd quite like to be the spotty youth again. But at this stage in my life, um, it was 16, I'd just done a levels. It's like, how do I do aviation? I know I want to be a pilot. Um, <clears throat> my careers officer wrote to the Air Force. They were not interested in, in showing anybody around. What else tell you I said, well, Fleet Air On. I didn't know a great deal about Fleet Air On. In fact, I know more about the Fleet Air On um, in the last the four, five, six years when I had time to do books about it than I did when I was in. But anyway, the ground up Fleet Air On. Marks. I, I've said to a lot of people, the Air Force did everything it could to dissuade me from joining, and the Navy did the opposite. And this is absolutely true. So they invited me down to Paul Rose, in Cornwall. Um, they flew me in everything. Every, every day I went flying, I was a member of the wardroom. I had a free bar bill in the wardroom, no questions asked at the age of 16. They bought my soul for pint and bar. <laughs> that, that is the reality. And that airframe there, 66. X1, I flew nine years later um, and got my wings on, on, the, uh, on the Gazelle. So, um, the Navy, not content with giving me lots of lager, gave me a flying scholarship. The Air Force didn't. I got a PPL uh, when I was 17 down at Ipswich. Sadly, the Air Force is now closed. Um, but you can read about that. You can read about me getting lost, filling out petrol, uh, and a very nice Air Force air traffic competition literally saving my bacon. Uh, and then the Navy continued to throw money at me. I went off to university, they gave me a cadetship, and in the holidays they taught me how to fly the chipmunk. And uh, me and a bunch of students given six chipmunks to take down to the south of France and bring them all back again, which we did. So, had I joined the Navy uh, on a cadetship and gone to university, uh, possibly that was a bad decision. I was rather convinced by a very glamorous set of Officer Ren at the time who fluttered her eyelashes. But she convinced me a cadet ship would be good, this would be good. The downside was I had to learn how to be a navigating officer first before I could go for it. <coughs> so uh, this is the first job at Hong Kong, HMS Moncton. Boy's own stuff. Boy's own stuff. And in fact, to be honest, the two or three months I had in Hong Kong basically ruined me for the rest of the, my time in the Navy. Because this is what the Navy was like in the 40s and 50s. It was, it was really halcyon day stuff. I uh, was officer watch, I was on my own picking up uh, illegal immigrants out of water, uh, nine millimeter pistol on my waist, you know, great. Uh, the following ship I went to, I was in charge of notice boards. Bit of a contrast. <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to hear all about that story, read my naval aviator That hovercraft is what you get if you ram a Chinese gunboat at 50 miles an hour. Um, so that happened just in my last week in Hong Kong. That patrol boat has got the hovercraft crew on it. 
um, taking them back into Chinese waters. HMS Moncton sailed all the 15 knots to the rescue and we managed to save them and get them back. Then I went on to do fishing protection. Um, again, lots of scrapes, fishing protection, very hard work, but I got uh, kidnapped by a French trawler and taken uh, halfway to France before we managed to rescue myself from um, I then did a bit of ship driving on the right, that's <coughs> HMS Plymouth. I was driving HMS Plymouth, very, very foggy, 90 meter fizz, in the Baltic, 20 knots, and I ran the German ring. Now, 40 years earlier, I might have got a medal. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in 1983, sadly, uh, medals weren't given out for that kind of thing. But we did a little bit of damage, it could have been worth it. Time to move on. Thank goodness they let me go flying eventually. So it lifted me flying the wasp, uh, and the natural progression from the wasp was to fly the lynx. I had hankered after uh, doing a bit of fast jet flying, doing a bit of sea harrier flying, but the, when I went through, there were no sea harrier vacancies, and then by the time I finished flying the wasp, um, domestically, I was then married and staying in Portland, and seemed probably more attractive at the time. So I then went flying the, the lynx. And I ended up uh, on this squadron, and I put it in really because there's, there's a couple of faces you might recognise in here. Uh, the chap in the middle, some of you might know. Anybody know this chap here? A bit younger than you would have seen him here. Got the Bob Burrows, he was head of mission system, senior naval officer here for a while. This chap here, Mike Burrows, um, he was a, we'd actually been on the same ship together briefly. Uh, we flew together, also on seven or two together, and he did the test pilot course a year ahead of me. Uh, and in fact, later on in my time at Boston Gang, we ended up both being selected to be tutors at the same time. He went to Texas River, and I went to UTPS. So, what next? I'd done all this stuff at the Navy, I got to this point, what next? The Navy, because of the way I joined, wanted to make me an apple. Not immediately. But in the fullness of time, people like me were meant to go up the career structure, driving ships, becoming PROs, all that kind of stuff. I never joined the Navy to be first sea lord. I joined the Navy to learn how to fly helicopters, particularly the WASP, and being fortunate to be selected to do it. So I was up against the system. I was swinging, swimming against the tide, square peg, round hole, that kind of thing. And um, so at that time, some of you will remember that um, back in the 70s, there was an ITV drama, Terms TV. I can't find any pictures of that documentary. If anybody's got one, I really, really love to have a picture for this talk. But that, 1976 was when I was just getting my PPL, just learning how to fly, and it's so good a positive scene. I thought in the fullness of time, I'd quite like to be a test pilot. And I did engineering at university, which was a bit of a mistake, but it was because of this concept. When I was flying the Lynx, this program came out, which again many of you will be familiar with. I think we have a star of that <laughs> so in the audience today. Dave Southam was in this uh, <coughs> TV documentary, it was BBC. Um, and th this portrayed the, the, uh, uh, a course, an ETPS course, that I didn't think I was up to. Uh, Bob Horton, who was a Navy, uh, now a Navy colleague really, at the time, he was the Navy student. Uh, he was struggling with his maths, struggling with the homework, struggling with all the late night report writing. And I thought, you know what? I can't do that. I'm not that clever. You know, I mean, I nearly failed maths at university. I've really struggled with an engineering degree. I, I don't think I can cut the mustard uh, at ETPS. So let's do something else. So at the time, there was an RAF officer whose sole job it was to steal, I use that word, but poach might be more appropriate coach air crew from elsewhere. So he was finding people in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, uh, but also he was, he was stealing people from the Army and the Navy over here. And for me, it was a good deal. The, ne the Air Force was very short of QFIs, and it wasn't until I got to Boston Man that I realised how much Air Force pilots hate QFIs. Nobody wants to be a QFI, do they? They all want to be HYs and weapons instructors and they don't want to be QFIs. Well, <coughs> by then I was an AT qualified helicopter instructor, and the rules were if you'd already done that, you could become a QFI quite easily and become an AT quite quickly. So the Air Force said to me, come on down, short course at Cranwell, we'll put you on the Takano, you'll be a QFI, 
six months' time, we'll put you on the hall or do well. And once you've done a tour of Bowie or whatever, then Bob's your uncle and you can do what you like. And that was the plan. And I got within a week of leaving the Navy and joining the Air Force. Literally, within a week. I was all, all set to go. Unfortunately, domestically, like so many of our lives, you know, timing of, of real life and our sort of fantasy fun stuff that we always get to do, they don't always time it. Uh, my wife was very ill, uh, consulted in Southampton, um, called us in to see him, and I said, this is what we're going to do, we're going to go off to Yorkshire, and then we go off to Scampton, and then we go off to Cranwell, we're going to do this, and he literally laughed at me. He laughed, he said, no, you're not. You're not going more than 40 miles from Southampton for a little while. So, okay, so that didn't work. So, okay, back to plan A, back to yes. So really, my kind of incentive, uh, I have to say, was driven by uh, some of the doors closing. So, selection process. I couldn't afford to fail to get into ETPS now. Uh, that was the pressure. The Navy selected one candidate each year. And, and the place that I particularly wanted was coming up in 1994, and that was to do the job that was based in Bedford. So back in the day, we had Farnborough and Bedford both doing flying, uh, experimental flying, and the, Bedford's, the Bedford slot was the, the one main helicopter slot, did all the handling quality stuff, all the interesting stuff. But it came up over three years, so I was desperate to do that. So I put a lot of energy into being selected. This, uh, I'd like to say I flew all of these. Um, I couldn't believe it. Back then we didn't have the internet, we didn't have all of that stuff. Just had phones, and I got on the phone, and I phoned up people in America. We had some friends today in Houston, and I managed to have lags and extra uh, leave. And I managed to get in touch with the head of training at NASA, you know, on the phone, personally. And he personally escorted me around NASA Houston for a day. And I flew the, uh, the shuttle simulator for an afternoon, did all the other good stuff. Bell helicopters. They said, yeah, come up and fly the V-22 simulator, come and fly the, the, the Cobra simulator. Great. And I went to visit Bedford, and I went to visit uh, Westlands, and I came here a few times. And so when I came to the interviews, I have to say, I must have been the most nervous candidate in the room. I'm pretty sure I was. But at least I'd done my own. At least I was prepared. And lo and behold, this is my course. Keith's in the photo somewhere. In fact, you could, you could get that where everybody is, Keith, couldn't you? I mean, what I think is brilliant about ETPS, and dare I say other test pilot schools, is the fact that the variety amongst the students is almost unrepeatable anywhere else. You know, you learn as much from your course mates as you do from the tutors. I think it's fair to say. And that's not because the tutors are done, it's just because you just <coughs> broaden your experience massively. Uh, somewhere on there is an Adelaide 3 pilot. Uh, he said, no, not much about flying in cloud, not much about this, not much about that. We knew an awful lot about chasing tanks in Adelaide 3. And so on. So we've got Army, Navy, Air Force, Canadians, Americans, Singapore, Italians. What a wealth of experience. So, <clears throat> what does ETPS do? Well, back then, it was an all military fleet. It's an irony now that it's changed, but back then it was a military fleet. Uh, the core teaching tool was the gazelle, but we had the scout and we had the mix and the seeking. And uh, one, of the things, one of the things I really appreciated, you know, looking back now as a, as a sort of experienced test partner, was the very short conversion courses we got. So, you know, if you joined the military, I mean, it took me six months to learn how to fly the gazelle. Six months. When I came here, they said, Chris, you've flown the gazelle before. 50 minutes, quick whiz around the houses, off you go so. Well, same with the scout. Scout, you know, you've flown the boss before, 50 minute, quick whiz around the houses, off you go in the scout. Same with the mix. On all of those aircraft, I managed to screw up <coughs> my cockiness and complacency, thinking I knew it. The seeking, we got two whole hours and a trip in the simulator. And I went flying with, uh, I think it was the Albert pilot. Um, and we, you know, we had two hours to duel, and then we went solo. When I was flying around the south side of Boston Bay, and I was doing pretty well, really, for a non-seeking pilot, I thought. I was doing all the exercises, all the training, and after 45 minutes, it started to rain. Big wings and wipes on the front of the seeking. The wiper switch. Now, where on earth is that? It's got to be up here, where it is in the links. It's got to be up here. And I looked and I looked and I looked, and could I find it? No. It's got to be down here. It's got to be on the centre console. No, it wasn't. 
after 10 minutes of looking, I landed on, we just sat there in the rain. And when my time was up, we taxied very meekly back into Peace Squadron um, and I asked an engineer where the switch was. And it's a funny little rotary knob, and these people tell me, what, why on earth is it down there? It's like none of the other switches, isn't it? It's like they ran out of proper switches and they just put a knob in. It's very good. But that was a brilliant, brilliant training uh, philosophy because in, in my day job working at CEA and my current job, I'm getting into lots of wacky things all the time with next to no chance to train or prepare. And that kind of um, being thrown at the deep end was, it was a brilliant uh, start of the tenure. I'm a closet fast jet pilot, really. I, I end the days a lot. Dave and I have been chatting uh, over coffee recently, and uh, I'm very envious of guys that get to do Mac 2, the hair on fire, the top of the mavericks of this world. Um, I, I went down a road and I did my WASP time and I'm very grateful for that. But I really did appreciate the chance to broaden my experience again on ETPS. The Hawk just blew me away. I loved the Hawk. I mean, I just, you know, what's wrong with the Hawk? It was, it was a lovely old time to fly. But uh, during that first year on the school, I was also flown in the Takano and in the BSC 111, or a, a company jet as I uh, refer to it in my book. And what else did I fly on ETS? So ETS again, very good then, and I'm sure it still is, but all the way through my time as a student and then on the staff. We spend a lot of energy trying to broaden the experience of our students. Increasingly, military pilots in particular don't do an awful lot. They don't get much variety. They quite often train and then go on an operational type, and that might be it. Uh, it's true, they're on pilots as well. So <coughs> a big part of ETPS in trying to teach people how to test pilots is to give them a broad knowledge, a broad base. Because a lot of the skill set we have as a test pilot is to say, I call it the rental car skill set. You know, in fact, it's not, not true these days with computers and glass screens in the rental cars. But broadly speaking, you and I can rent a car from Avis and within a few minutes we can get in and we can drive it without killing ourselves or anybody else. And that's, that was very much the ETPS philosophy. Helicopters fly the helicopters, jets fly the jets, big airplanes fly the big airplanes. The challenge for we test pilots is always to work out which particular idiosyncrasy is going to kill us on this particular area. And invariably, the, the thing that was going to kill us in those was the foreign test pilots sat alongside us. Because the number of times uh, this, this repeated itself during my year as a student and member of staff and subsequently, if you're flying with somebody alongside you from a different culture, maybe a different language, maybe a different country, his training is not the same as yours. His expectations are not the same as yours. What he's going to do next is not what you expect. And I've learned that lesson repeatedly over and over again. But a fantastic way to go. That's me uh, doing my preview. That's the Augusta Bell 212. So at the end of the course, we all had to do um, a training uh, exercise. Back then, it was 10 hours flying, give or take. And that's me, uh, a Prati Damari, the Italian test centre. That's me flying around the mountains in Rome. Um, in the first few days, somebody said, we all go flying around the mountains in Rome. I went, how far away is that? Last? 19 minutes that way, 19 minutes that. Three hours out of 10, just to get to the mountains. <laughs> yeah, we can justify that. A bit of level flight performance, and off we went. Uh, and that's me actually flying it. Um, when I landed to pick up the guy that took the picture, I landed on one of those rocks, unbeknownst to me and the rest of the crew. When we got the back to Pratica, I bent the skid. I had a very nervous night working, waiting for the engineers to determine whether my landing on a rock had ripped an helicopter off for the week or not. Uh, if they had to change the skid, uh, we'd have lost the helicopter for the rest of the time. So thankfully, they let me fly the following week. Whew! So I have another. That's me again, young, young chap that I am then, less grey hair. It's amazing what flight test does for you, isn't it, really? And that's a chap called Colin Hay. Uh, at the Kenner dinner, uh, uh, my recollection is we started drinking that day very early in the day. You know, when the kids, I, I mean, it's all very vague to me. And I certainly remember we had quite a bit to drink before we got to the dinner. We drank heavily at the dinner. So when the prizes were being given out, I definitely wasn't expecting to hear my name uh, at all. And uh, when, when the Western Trophy, which was the kind of top Rotary student name, was called out, I didn't actually hear my name. I just plopped a whole bunch of people looking at me and giving me a bit of a note in the week. So I guessed it was my turn. 
Um, if you read the book, you'll discover that that was a particularly important event, not for the sake of just getting the trophy, but within a few weeks, if not a few days of that, the Royal Navy, God bless them, tried to uh, send me off to another job entirely, nothing to do with flight test. And it was only because I got a letter, a personal letter from an admiral, that I was able to write a response to his personal letter, which is not normal etiquette for military guys. You don't normally write to admirals, I don't know. Uh, and on the strength of that letter, the, the decision was reversed. So uh, winning that trophy was actually far more important than the kudos of this kind of trophy. And then on to this mop, Experimental Fly Squadron. Well, if my eclectic crowd was um, uh, impressive as a bunch of students, this lot, although they don't look impressive, it's, it's an impressive moment there. You've got two or three staff pilots, you've got a uh, tornado, ground attack pilot, tornado, a three pilot, phantom pilot, Harrier pilot, army wings pilot, hunter pilot, a C-130 pilot, and me. And the even better news was, that was all the pilots we had, to do all the work that we had. So every time we went off to fly these things, it invariably were two pilots, we didn't have two fast jet pilots, we didn't have two heavy aircraft pilots. What we had was me and a mate. Um, and depending on how we were crewing it, if it was a helicopter, I'd have a, a fast jet mate usually flying the helicopter whilst I did the paperwork. If it was a fast jet or heavy aircraft, I get to go flying whilst he did all the hard work. So again, a, a, just a brilliant boys own kind of job. But first, the first project I had was flying around this. Looks like the uh, a bit of soup or something that the butler's got. This is the Merlin radar. This is the radar that went on to uh, fit in the, in the Merlin itself. And this was typical of what we were doing. This was a farmer task. And basically, we were flying around a whole bunch of different sensors um, for research. Well, so this was effectively proving the effectiveness of this radar. This is me and a bunch of guys. Uh, that's me and a sea king. The guy I'm with is uh, an engineer. But one of the other quirks of uh, experimental flying squadron was we, we flew the sea king in very single pilot, um, which was generally not done. I mean, Steve will, uh, will tell me the generals used to do it, the uh, commander guys used to do it by training up an air crewman. We used to do it by training up one of our boffins to be uh, a handler for the manual rockets which were in the reef. Um, but that's me flying this particular aircraft. The night before I, this photo was taken, um, it had been a manic three months. I, I, I basically joined the squadron in January. This is now the end of March. I didn't know that the, the R&D money, and you guys probably know this much better than me, but it all runs out at the end of the financial year. It's a bit like tarmacking and drives and runways. You know, it all happens at the end of March because we've got a pot of money we haven't spent. <laughs> Go, 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 spend it. Um, and we were flying uh, three, four sorties a day, absolutely flat out. We were briefing uh, four trips first thing in the morning, and then sometimes not even getting off dispersal, walking from one aircraft to the next. I thought that's what flight test was always going to be like, and um, it wasn't. The night before uh, I went to fly this, at the end of March, the, one of the boffins said, isn't it a shame that this helicopter has its last flight tomorrow? So what do you mean? So this, is one of the first of four um, Sikorsky SH-3s that were brought into the UK that Westland's copied to make the Seeking. So it's, it's a Westland Seeking Mark 1 or it's an SH-3, depending on your point of view. On the pedals it says Sikorsky. So isn't it a check? It, it was the last of the batch of four. So again, I uh, can't let that happen. It's five, six o'clock at night. I'm on the phone to Google to and Google, etc., etc. And we did a photo shoot. Um, and that's me flying that aircraft the following day over this person. The weather on the day was absolutely dire, and if you want to know how that particular flight went, please read my, uh, please read my book. But it was a very touch and go flight. Um, some of the other projects. We had a great fleet of aircraft. This is 559, uh, which was the Bedford Research and Development Aircraft. Uh, it went on to become part of the school. Um, that's me not landing on the rolling platform. Uh, I wasn't allowed to land on it, um, but the, the, the boss and down wanted some good PR photos. And this photo, you've probably seen it, haven't you? Hanging on walls somewhere around Boss and Down. It was used in all the glossy magazines for, for years and years after this. If you look carefully at that Lynx at the rotor head, uh, you'll see it hasn't got a regular Lynx damper on it. 
That's because we had an awful lot of instrumentation on that aircraft and we could put on two balsa wood rotor blades and I say balsa wood, they had balsa wood sheaths over the, the, the spar and within that balsa wood sheath there's a whole bunch of aerodynamic sensors and they would feed all that information down through that sort of cam on top down into the aircraft where we had the shed made of recording uh, equipment and that. So we could do an awful lot of aerodynamic research. Same with the tail rotor. The project that I was working on when the money ran out was to do with tail rotor failures. And we were doing an awful lot of control inputs in that aircraft to try and simulate what happens if the tail rotor fails. We were eventually going to put a clutch in the tail rotor drop shaft. Thankfully, the money ran out. <laughs> I'm not sure how keen I would have been to just declutch my tail rotor and leave. Um, very hard to get photos of this aircraft. This is 285, this is the farm links. So one of our big jobs at the time was pre-Apache, pre the UK Army buying its attack helicopter. So we were doing an awful lot of research as to what battlefield helicopters should do, how they do it, how they fly in crap weather, etc. etc. So we had a turret on the front, this was an MPG compatible aircraft. We did a lot of trials uh, for MPG on this. What do you think is going on here whilst I sit in my tea? What, what trial is this? Any ideas? Respirator, AR5. Uh, Sorry? AR5 respirator. It, well, a lot of people say it's an AR5. No, I mean the helmet itself is actually um, a, a Apache helmet. It's a, it's a helmet used by the Apache, and as, as such, it had a foam fit in it. So you had to get your head squirted with um, goo, and that meant that this helmet didn't move around at all. Once it was on your head, it was always in a known position. Any other ideas? Steve, you remember for this. Did you ever go at this? Was there something to do with the review room? I had some stuff like that. Field of view. Field of view. Well, <laughs> because, bizarrely, you know, we've grown up with NVG, particularly in the helicopter world, since Vietnam, all the way through the Falklands. And, and the, the philosophy at the time was very much, um, you know, if you think NVG, there's a little, uh, there's a sort of toilet tubes go on your eyes. It's like looking through two toilet tubes. And like anything else, you can do look through toilet tube to see where you're going. And if you move your head around enough, you can kind of see what's around you. And the driver was very much, let's make this field of view of the goggles better. Let's give it a wider field of view. It was almost like a sort of exponential cost to do that, you know, to, to, to change the technology to increase this 40 degree field of view, even by two or three degrees, was stupidly expensive. But nobody had actually worked out what field of view pilots needed to fly. Which, you know, you can kind of understand it, it crept up on us all. And, uh, and being able to see in the dark was better than not being able to see in the dark. So, um, but that trial is basically, we, we got a whole bunch of little cutouts. And we put them in this helmet. The helmet didn't move on our heads. So we could actually very precisely limit the field of view that the pilot could use to see out of. And then we did a whole bunch of flying tasks that were quite difficult and we did them with increasing field of view, decreasing field of view to try and work out which, you know, at what point they got more difficult. It may not surprise you to know that the more you see, the easier it is. That was the conclusion. <laughs> we, we thought there might be, a, like we would call it a knee in the curve, a sort of distinct cutoff where you got more bang for your buck. You know, if 60 degrees, you know, if, if we could only get to 60 degrees and then there wasn't much benefit, then let's go with 60 degrees. We, we had to get down to 20 degrees field of view before we couldn't fly properly. So actually the cutoff was 20 degrees field of view, and at 40 degrees field of view, we pilots can cope. So guess what? There's no more money to make your MPG much wider. And I do an awful lot of MPG work now uh, in the civil sector, and they are the same MPGs really. The, the technology is better, the images are better, but the field of view hasn't changed. It's the same sort of 40 degrees, 40 degrees. Uh, I love this helicopter. People ask me when I do these talks, what's my favourite aeroplane, what's my favourite helicopter. This is my favourite helicopter. This is 503. It's a X Air Force Wessex XC2. Uh, heavily modified. Uh, it had a glass cockpit inside, albeit uh, monochrome. Um, but it had a lot of uh, gizmos in the back. It had a sort of uh, flight control system thing that you can change. And I did an awful lot of work with, with this particular helicopter and, and I loved it. The pinnacle of my time on experimental flying squadron, I have to check my watch halfway through, so, um, was this. So the Bedford work, apart from handling qualities, was all to do about 
dynamic interface, landing on the back of the ship. And really, that's why that job needed a naval pilot. It needed somebody like me, with a lot of WASP and MIGS time, a lot of deck experience, to be able to help inform the discussions and the debate. And a lot of work had gone into this trial. In fact, two years of stuff ashore uh, had gone into this trial. I did a trial with a Bedford van driving up and down Boston Down. At the start of the trial, I'm sitting there in the hover. The Bedford van is sitting at the end of the runway. Why is the Bedford van not moving? The clutch is packed up. And so, the clutch is packed up. What are we going to do? I don't know why it fell to me as a pilot of the Wessex to tell the guys in, in the Bedford van to slam it into second. And it slammed into second. There was a lot of burden on And off we went down the runway. And we got the trial done. Um, but this is, the, this is the pinnacle of it all, coming to sea. Um, that's me landing on. Uh, one of the challenges of the Type 23 and the Wessex, Type 23 is a frigate, uh, it's small, flight deck's okay for a Lynx, it's actually okay for a Merlin, but the, the undercarriage footprint for the Wessex is quite different to a Merlin or a Sinking or whatever, because the tail wheel is almost right down the back. So the, the distance between the front of the rotors and the tail wheel is bloody long. Um, it turns out it's about 55 feet. And the total distance you've got on the, on the deck, even if you count it off a pad, is only about 70 feet, maybe a bit less. That falls completely outside all our Navy uh, deck landing rules, without a shadow of that. And it was quite a rough sea. Um, that didn't help. And uh, so, you know, we, we were up against it really. And in fact, one of the things I put an extract from my book on um, Facebook last week about this trial. And said so one of the challenges was the bum line, because if you look at the flight deck, there's also a white lane, white, white line painted across it. Uh, and the thinking being, if you put your backside on it and slide sideways across that, your helicopter's in the right place. But that was set up for a Lynx and Merlin. It wasn't set up for a Western. So I had to kind of make it, uh, and we got it off. But there wasn't an awful lot of room. Uh, and we succeeded in doing the trial. And having done some stuff in the Wessex, uh, I then moved on to flying the Lynx, which is just as well, because we were uh, operating in Sea State 8 by the end of the trial. And we, this was Sea State 8, just off Portland. It is the roughest weather of Portland, and I used to work at Portland. It's the roughest weather of Portland I've ever experienced. And Sea State 8 was the roughest um, seas I'd operated the Lynx in. The Lynx, incredibly capable. Uh, I was glad that we moved from the west onto this before we got to Sea State 8. What we were doing, well, we were looking at a whole bunch of landing aids. And I think my biggest regret with all of this stuff is, is you know, it was great R&D, but then you know, some of it's gone into service, some of it didn't. We had a, we had a gyro stabilized horizon bar, which I would have killed for as a wasp pilot. Uh, we had something called a landing period designator, which gave me some traffic lights to tell me when the deck might or might not be in minutes, and so on. So and it was a very successful trial, uh, and everyone was very pleased. And that kind of marked the end of my two years on experimental flight. Uh, but my joy, if you like, my, my takeaway from experimental science program was not just the helicopter stuff, but it was getting a chance to fly with my mates. I flew this with the Boston Squadron, John Pierce, uh, that's the farmer of Hunter. I flew around with my mate Trevor Roach in uh, in Yande, on the edge of some for quite a bit. Uh, we flew together in this Jaguar quite a bit, which was a lot of fun. Um, however, it had to end. Money ran out and uh, it had to end. And Mike uh, Burroughs and I were sat in the office one day, a phone call came from the Navy appointer, this time not trying to send me off to a dodgy job, but he basically rang me first and said, Chris, um, I've got a job and I've got another job. And you and Mike Burroughs are two guys going to these jobs. I'm going to tell you what they are, and then I'm going to call him and tell him what they are, and then you can work out who goes where. So one job was um, a tutor at ETPS. Uh, the RAF couldn't fill a post, so although there was a Navy guy there already, the Air Force couldn't fill a slot, and I was invited to go and fill that slot. The other job was Patuxent River, Navy, East Coast, ah, Patuxent River, you know, flying all manner of stuff, with jet ranges and the sea <coughs> You know, guess what? I wanted to go to Pax River. And um, so I put the phone down quite gingerly, and I saw Mike getting exactly the same phone call, you know, and he was looking at me, and I was looking at him. And uh, he said, right, you know, what should we do? Let's go home and talk to our wives and reconvene at 9 o'clock for the coffee in the morning, which is exactly what we did. By the time we got into the office, had a coffee, closed the door, 
Uh, again, domestically, my goalposts had moved. Uh, my wife still wasn't brilliantly well. And the idea of uh, up, up in sticks from the UK, where we had a lot of, dare I say, excellent NHS sport and moving to the States, wasn't necessarily a pleasure thing. Uh, and she was also a solicitor and wanted to go back to work at some stage. And again, uh, that wouldn't have been easy in the States. So by the time I, I, I told the boss, as it were, um, on the night before, and she gave me a fairly strict brief that I was to go in and bat pretty hard for ETPS. So I'm looking at Mike and he's looking at me and um, he said, well, you know, protection would be really good. I'm going, yeah, it would be really good. And anyway, eventually we put each other out of misery. Um, his wife was desperate to go to the States uh, and I told him my situation. Uh, they are still out there. So Mike um, did two tours out there. He then got a job with the army out there. Um, they live out there. He's happy as well. You know, it worked out incredibly well for both of them. Sometimes it doesn't work. Back to ETPS. Now, I told you I got the Western Trophy. So somebody at ETPS messed up and thought I knew what I was doing. When I got back as a cheater, I realised I didn't. I realised I knew not at all. So the first year as a cheater at ETPS, it was true of me, I don't know if it's true of anybody else, but I was about one week ahead of my students <laughs> throughout the first year. Occasionally 10 days, occasionally 24 hours. But broadly speaking, it's about one week ahead. And I would be reading the stuff up, I'd be having to teach it, I'd be having to relearn it, I'd be flying with my contemporaries so that they could show me what the demos were and explain to me yet again what longitude was the thing was. I often went to the Rizal and I had to teach them students. I had to teach them the avoid curve, very exciting stuff. Uh, but the lessons I learned as a tutor were what actually allowed me to do the job this year, yeah, if I'm perfectly honest. What I learned in, uh, I think as a student, <coughs> fit the purpose of the experimental flight squad and all that I did here, but the challenges I've faced since Boss uh, I don't think I could have faced without being a tutor for seven years. Seven years here. I learned a lot. Um, in the first year, I'd uh, done a bit of fixed wing flying now on the FS. They needed a co-pilot for the 111 in case the pilot contact. Of course, he never did. But the good news was I got a couple of goes in the 111 and uh, technically qualified as a co-pilot, which is a lot of fun. Uh, they wanted me to fly the Basset. Uh, I love flying the Basset. Modified by Cranfield in the 70s to a very good system. So the student pilot Computer, the tutor had the real controls, and by varying a few dozens and a few sort of uh, analog resistors, you could change the handling qualities of this in, in an instant. I just thought it was a brilliant, brilliant tool. I, I was actually wept when I heard that Boston Down stopped flying it and, uh, and decided to uh, make it unairworthy and stick it in the apprentice school. What a shame. My first training flight on this with the QFI. Uh, what we'll do, Taylor, we'll go west of Boston Down, we will uh, do it stalling, we'll cut steep turns, we'll shut down the left hand engine, I'll show you what it's like to fly on one, and then we'll relight it. This aeroplane does not fly on one engine, <laughs> like the way we flew up. It doesn't. One engine takes you to see the crash. So we shut down the left hand engine, yeah, prove it that, we're descending nicely, thanks, good, great, excellent. Uh, let's light the engine up again, wouldn't we'll light up. And so I'm on my own in this aircraft because the guy alongside me who's got all the experience hasn't got any working control. So I said, put a pan call out, good idea, really cool. We're drifting down for Boston there and we're just going to make it. We're coming in down, down into the circuit. Um, I'm thinking, well, I'm not going to put the wheels down yet. I'm just going to come around the corner. I'm going to go like halfway down the road and make sure I don't mess it up. And I see Brian on the other seat and he's got his hands on the, on the control wheel. And he's putting inputs. Around the corner, and I think, oh right, perhaps he is connected, perhaps I didn't get it right. And actually, it's quite a useful cue. I found if I just copied what he was doing, we came around the corner, we flared nicely, we landed on, we pulled off after a bit of momentum. I said, fine, I didn't realise the controls were connected. He said, they're not. I said, did you realise you were flying it? And was like, he had no idea. It was that sort of self preservation thing. He was just going to help us. Anyway, it was an incremental training. Program. I landed with one engine the first time and two engines the second. So that's easy to guess for you. Uh, not happy enough with the, the Basset, um, Rick Pope, who was our project pilot for the Astra Hawk, had been pestering him because I used to uh, fly students in the, uh, the Basset, uh, and the, well, after we had a go in the Basset, we used to move on to the Astra Hawk. 
Again, brilliant aircraft, very little stability. Uh, the, you see there's only one pilot in that. He sat in the back. That's a bit odd for any port. If you look at you know, Red Arrow's guys, they sit in the back. And that's because that was modified to put the steering controls in the front. And so the P1, the, the general <coughs> controls, are all in the back. Uh, Rick says, right, let's, let's have a go at this. Uh, I think I'll tell you all about the VSS system. Brief, brief, brief. Oh, by the way, you've just got to check the engine, and then I'll tell you all the <coughs> uh, computer stuff. Check the engine. Yeah, it's just had a bit of work done on the engine. So we've just got to go up to 44,000 feet and do what we call slam checks, just make sure that the, the throttle works. And uh, okay, so we get to 44,000 Throttle back to idle, slams the throttle forward. It's quite a lot of banging. I'm going, yeah, I don't know about this. Is this more? And the next thing I hear is mayday, mayday, mayday. Oh, bugger. That'll be the engine stopping there. <laughs> and uh, he got onto uh, stress and diversion, we gli you know, glided, we took it glide uh, down to St. Morgan. We did manage to get the engine uh, relit at about 20,000 feet, but descending from 44,000 feet down to 20,000 feet was quite uh, concerning, mainly because it was a Friday afternoon, it was the summer holidays, and I'm looking down with my roads. I'm thinking, how on earth am I going to get home from Cornwall on a Friday afternoon? <laughs> but uh, we did because my mate. Picked away, came and picked me up in the uh, gazelle. And uh, that was a bit of a deja vu because, uh, oh, and I, I got to fly the animal a bit as well. Um, earlier in the, that same year, so if you've seen Top Gun Maverick and you've seen Top Gun, if you remember Top Gun, the original, when he beats up the tower and he busts the hard deck and all that stuff, and somebody says, you know, Maverick, you've got a hell of a first day. Well, I had a hell of a first year, and yes, I, I'd already had the uh, the May Day and bits and pieces. <coughs> this is me flying the scan. It's the first day back after Easter leave. Um, and it's, you know, my boss says, go off and do some currency. I'm on my own. It's quite a windy day. The wind wasn't down the runways here at Boston Down. Um, so I went up to Netherwegen, which is an airfield I don't know very well. Um, and I was doing some engine off landings. Well, that was my intention. That was my hope. I did all the unending work up to do that. And that's me after the first one. And astutely, you'll notice if you look uh, on my left shoulder <laughs> where the danger sign is, there's no tailroad of drive shaft where there should be a tailroad of drive shaft. So, what I've done was I come down, uh, landed heavily, the aircraft had bounced. If you ask proper Army scout pilots, can you bounce a scout to a man? <coughs> however many beers they've had, they will tell you you cannot bounce a scout. It's build up, proverbial, or whatever. It kind of rained for weeks and weeks and weeks in the rain. It was rock hard. I, I came down slightly heavily. I bounced slightly as the aircraft was going up, the rotor blades were coming down, and, and that's what happened. I didn't know I cut through my tail with a drive shaft. Um, I thought the landing was a bit heavy. Uh, I'm sitting there with the rotor blades clacking around me, thinking I'd better do something about this. Uh, and I had two choices really, shut down and have a look, or wind the throttle open and taxi to dispersal, which is what I intended to do and have a look. But when I tried to lift up into the holder, um, I started going around in circles, which was not a good thing. So, and then my mate, Tim Mace, the army guy, who saw me working with two or three uh, years earlier, turned up, he was then managing the airfield, he turned up on a big motorbike and said, he didn't want to do that. <laughs> so, you know what? You're absolutely right. Um, one of the, the, the things I'm proud of at CCPS was having crashed the scout uh, in my final year there as a sort of regular helicopter tutor. Um, I decided it would be a good idea if we could replace our full helicopter. And trying to do that quickly and easily and cheaply was key. And I thought, wouldn't it be good if we could just lease a helicopter that's already on the military register somewhere? And to cut a very long story short, uh, 32 Squadron, the VIP Squadron were flying this model of squirrel trains and helicopter around for uh, you know around London, North Hall, that kind of thing. I think it would take a few weeks, took the best part of two years actually, to get this thing military registered and on the dispersal in an ETPS colour scheme. Alongside me there was Dick Hutchins. Uh, Dick was then the sort of financial manager kind of guy for Connecticut and ETPS. Dick, uh, if you didn't know, Dick Hutchins um, was the pilot of the Sea King 4 that during the Falklands War decided to take a bunch of SAS guys into Argentina to attack the exit missiles at source. And they got a bit lost and they were running at petrol and they ended up in Chile. 
uh, and he was flown back from Chile a week later. But we all survived uh, and after the person to go over. And he's got a book out actually, <laughs> if you want to read it. Ah, the other joy of ETPS. I mean, I think, uh, uh, I mean, you know, Dave, Dave will know this better than most of us here, but for me, um, being on the staff, that because we were broadening the experience of our students, we also got to experience those aircraft ourselves as, as tutors, as uh, instructors. Um, so uh, the fly around in the Danube and the Tucano, the Twin Pioneer, the bottom right, I mean, that, that's an aircraft you can land literally in, a, in, a, in its own length. I mean, landing on runway 23, big runway, piano keys, you could land it on the piano keys. Um, VAR carrier, um, if, you, if you follow my uh, multimedia, social media, whatever it is, crap, um, I, I put an article about that on it, an extract from my book. With, without a doubt, my flight in that aeroplane is the most memorable flight in an aeroplane to date. It just blew my socks off. Sitting in the hover as a helicopter pilot, moving a mill to the thumb wheel <coughs> to end up hurtling across the airfield 300 knots a few seconds later. Absolutely mind blowing. So, uh, you know, thank you, ETPS. And they got to fly a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, I am so fortunate. Um, and these are all the other aircraft uh, that we got to fly. When, when our students did a preview exercise, they always allocated a tutor. Uh, we got a tutor and grabbed with them. And part of the deal was we'd hang around for the first week just to make sure the logistics were working and so on. We would also fly the aircraft ourselves so that we could understand their very comprehensive and accurate report that they would deliver to us three or four weeks later. And so you know, I got to fly and test all these wonderful aircraft. And, and there was a time, and it's a, it's a boast and brag, but mainly speaking true, that I could be, as long as I was in, in the western world somewhere, you know, hear a helicopter behind me, there was every chance I had playing, playing that time. And we went out to PAX and I met my mate Mike and we got flying in the Beaver and the Water and the DC-3 used to come in here and pretend to do all sprays at the band of it, it was great. My four years, so basically I was three years here in the Navy and then uh, yet again the Air Force couldn't replace me in one ETPS so I was at the last minute asked to extend another year. I said to the Navy, what are you going to do with me now? This guy that's been a test pilot at Boston Air for 10 years, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, what do you, how can you use me, this resource? Um, the answer was to put me in the same job I had 10 years earlier before I got to Boston Air, which was running the Link Simulator. The only difference was it was now in Goldington rather than Paul. I thought, no, you've got to be kidding. You know, I, I, I surely got more to offer UK PLC than running a simulator complex back at Portland again. So I, I quit, I, I uh, put my notice in. Uh, again, I was quite close to, to leaving uh, here and the Navy and everything when um, the then boss of the squadron, uh, Dave Best, who some of you will know, had an initiative. He was, he was very entrepreneurial, he still is, and uh, he was aware that the other test pilot schools around the world were doing very well at offering short courses and uh, that kind of thing. And, and obviously if you offer a two-week course to somebody and they like it, guess what, their mates often come back for a longer course or a trial-month course. And, and this is the time when, when Kinetic was not yet in place, but the MOD at the time was getting more entrepreneurial as well and more money focused. So um, he basically said, let's set up a short course department. Um, he put uh, a navigator in charge of it to start with, uh, and I went to support him and then uh, continued to run the department as a test pilot. On the face of it, a bit of a lacklustre post, uh, because it's, well, what am I going to do? When are you going to just do fly these little short courses? Well, I'm not going to do the big stuff and grand stuff that I used to do. No, but uh, what, what's important for this job is that you teach fixed wing as well as rotary wing. I thought, wow, that's a shock. So within, within days of starting the job, I was in the Bassett with Dave Best and all the other fixed wing teachers that flew it, standardising on how to teach fixed wing flight test, which was an eye opener. Uh, I, every step in it, I was reading the fixed wing flight test manual. I was sitting in all the fixed wing phase groups and so on and so forth. So again, a bit like that first year as a rotary tutor, it was a very steep learning curve for me uh, in that first year. The other attractive nature of the job was uh, bringing G registered, bringing civil registered aircraft to support the course. Now, this is a real irony I find now that ECPS is a civilian school. Because back then, this was swimming against the tide in a big way. You know, I barely made hay. 
Um, but in the first year, the, the way to do it that was squeaky clean was for me to go on the book to the local flying school at Thruxton, which I did. In the morning, I pick up this aircraft, I do the check A, I bring it to Boston, we fly it from dispersal just like a gazelle, and at the end of the day, I take it back, put it in the hangar, dust it off, 12 hour days, but you know, very enjoyable, very rewarding. Did that successfully for a year, and then there was an awful lot of nervousness, for want of a better term, around the bazaars, and I don't think they're going to do that anymore. And then in my final year in this job, uh, some of you will be aware that Kinetic came into being. We then had something called a long term partnering agreement, LTPA, I think that's what it was called. And uh, for our short courses, we were no longer allowed to use any of our kinetic assets. I don't know what it's like now, but for that year, I was running short courses, not allowed to use my own classrooms, not allowed to use my own aircraft. Bizarre. But back to the trusty aircraft and G-Motion aircraft, I then brought G-Motion uh, aircraft in and flew our students, the trials officers around uh, in G-Motion aircraft. So it kind of came good, incredibly frustrating. Um, by the time I got to my third year in this job, I had brick dust in my forehead because I was starting to, uh, to give up with it. The final initiative was to fly the jet stream uh, in Cranfield. They've got this wonderful classroom. I, again, I spent an awful lot of energy getting qualified on the Cranfield jet stream. Did a lot of flying in this aircraft. Again, only to find the nervousness at the top and an email one night saying, stop, 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 you can't do this anymore. No real explanation, very upsetting, very frustrating. The, the final bit of this jigsaw I really quite enjoyed was helping out the FTEs. They used to go to Germany and fly this aircraft every year, uh, and I'd be their project pilot. Again, another VSS asset. But by the time I've done this for three years, as I say, it got too frustrating. And if you, if you want to know more, read, read my book. Um, and a job came up, um, I'm just about to finish, I think. But a job came up at the UK CEA. I had given up on the UK CEA as being a post I could aspire to because they had a helicopter test pilot, they, they only needed one, and he was much older than me, I didn't think he was going to retire. But ironically, they needed a fixed wing test pilot. So me, as a helicopter test pilot, um, found themselves being recruited by the UK CEA as a fixed wing test pilot. Again, bizarre. It's a bit like that, see one, do one, teach one. So I had been teaching fixed wing flight tests, but I'd not actually ever done any really. Um, prior to joining the CEA, and next thing you know, I'm doing a show. The, the, what you are about to hear is all in this book. Um, and, and this book, I, I tried, this book is meant to be reasonably funny, reasonably accessible, not too much jargon in it. Um, you tell me if I succeed. Uh, the CEA recruited me ostensibly to fly things like King Airs, uh, you know, the big single, that big um, aeroplanes of the day, but not the airline. So I didn't fly the airline but I flew all the, the airplanes. Um, things like this was a military project. In fact, I'm just about to go and fly something like this over soon. First fixed wing job, I'll mention it because it, it was, again, incredibly steep learning curve. Um, I've been with CEA for about a year. I'm now working under contract for NASA, the European uh, Agency. I'm sent off to America to validate this <coughs> certification. It's a Columbia airplane. Uh, it was eventually taken over by Cessna. This is an aircraft that had already been assessed by the FAA and found to be super duper, all sorted out, meets all the certification requirements. So I went flying it. I went flying it. This lady, Sonia, Sonia was a Bavarian. Um, she didn't have my sense of humour, or I didn't have hers. I don't know which way it was. She just tattered me quite a lot. Anyway, I went flying with this aircraft, did the stalling. Civil certification stalling, unlike military stalling, is very prescriptive. The requirements are an airplane like that at the stall and the stall has to be defined by the nose dropping or the stick coming back at the stall, within reason you should be able to control the wing drop and maintain wind level within 15 degrees and the back. At the stall, roll the lungs back. <coughs> 110 degrees, roll. Okay, roll lungs back. Being the Muppet that I am, and not having fixed wing credibility, because as I said, I'd come up as a helicopter pilot, oh, must be me, must be me, must be technique, must be something I did wrong. Degrees from the aeroplane, I've got a flight test engineer with me. Right, let's very cautiously repeat that test point, and we have to, yes, down by all the last three, two, one, there, bang, roll it off there. Roll it back three times, that's enough. So we came back and uh, we had to sort it out. The aircraft had been certified 
through the FEA. This chap, Ed Colano, really nice guy, um, just become a fellow at SCTP. I voted for him. He's a Skyhawk pilot, a US Marine Corps pilot. He'd been a tutor at Pax River. The problem in this situation is civil, sir, is I go across as the Muppet from Europe. The mighty FAA have already approved this airplane. It is safe, it passes muster. They've flown it, they say it's okay. We have a big meeting. Basically, we took this guy out for beer the night before and we had a big meeting over a curry. And, uh, and I'm saying to him, you know, what do you understand by the curry? What do you understand by this and the other? Um, he basically agreed with my understanding of the requirement, which was good. Following morning, big ding dong, because he is now with the company on one side of the table and I'm on the opposite. Because this guy, Ed, has flown the aircraft and knows it's safe and compliant. Sonia knows it's safe and compliant, we think. And uh, it's a big deal. Anyway, we went and had some coffees and donuts and came back. And eventually, Sonia, the, uh, the German company test pilot, who was not a graduate test pilot, she was a self improver uh, TP, uh, she eventually got a very thick report out, threw it on the desk, owned it to where she had reported on the store characteristics, and reported on the massive wing drop that she had experienced. How did all that happen? Well, in the end, we ended up putting an awful lot of little stickers down the front. Um, that, that was the solution. Because it turned out what had happened was the, the FAA test flown an aircraft without the nose wheel and the main wheel spats on. So they'd actually flown an aircraft with a completely different airflow around the wing. Me flying it with wing spats on, and particularly the nose wheel spat, different airflow. So we ended up sticking the lozenges down the front, which disturbed the airflow over the wing and basically broke the airflow up and allowed the stall characteristics to become certifiable. Polish helicopter. This is a helicopter I'm really grateful for, uh, or my time at ETPS as a tutor. This is my brother. That doesn't look massive, that new one, but I'll tell you, when you're going along at 30 odd miles an hour and you're completely out of control going inside, it's very amazing. Uh, 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 if, you, if you're a student, you look at the coming angle on the blades, there's nothing left. Um, we're landing on tarmac, and we're on the ground, and grass. And, and you can't control it because the tail rotor sure suffers the same problems as the density altitude effect on the main rotor. That, that, that helicopter had dreadful um, engine off characteristics. It flew like the scout, actually. Uh, in many ways, it wasn't on the scout. So, all my time in the scout and all the engine offs I did for the ETPS subsequently to prepare me for that. Uh, this was another job where we were clashing with the, uh, <coughs> the FAA approved this aircraft before we got there. Um, they're now flying around the UK, as many of you will be aware. Um, we got there the first day, these things are typical, you talk to the company, Sikorsky, you know, get all the reports out, work out what we're going to do, and they said, yeah, there's just uh, one little problem we want to talk to you about, what's that? They said, ah, well, we want to hover low level at night because it's search and rescue, and we can't ensure that uh, problems with the flight control system are better than 10 to the minus 9. You know, we can't rule out an error in the Autopilot, okay, well what's the error? Uh, well it's multi-axis, and so it's full nose up, full roll to the left, um, full yaw to the left, and full collective down. So, um, so this is me doing that. This is the second day I did it. The first day I did it, it scared me to death. We have to uh, put a one second delay time in, so we put the multi-axis runaway in. I can't do anything until it's counted to 1001, which is a hell of a long count, and then I have to recover that. Uh, we have to pull 20% more than the max available torque. We're flying at uh, a few percent over the max orbit. Um, very, very scary stuff. And, and the problem with uh, the civil cert test pilot is in, in Boston Down, we hammered the incremental approach. You know, in, everything you do as a test pilot, you do incrementally. You build up to it. As a civil certification test pilot, that's what you want to do. The reality is, you are looking for the marginal test points that the company's found. So in this case, this is a marginal test point that the company's found. I don't have three weeks of doing runaways to test this. I just get in and do it with the company test pilot alongside me. There's no doubt uh, in his mind and my mind that had I screwed up on this kind of testing, 
he couldn't have intervened quick enough. There's, there's no room for error. The same with all the engine offs in the SW4. If you get it wrong, there is no room uh, for error. This is, it works, um, the uh, me flying the Sikorsky profile following a single engine failure, which is scary. And uh, uh, we'll see another one in a minute. And this was uh, doing it as per the book, um, and basically I'm assessing it, can the average line pilot flying an S92 cope with a single engine failure doing this? but very demanding. And, and this is an aircraft that hovers very nose up. When you do that flare, you can see nothing out at all. So one of the changes we made to the um, approach was you had to yaw off 10, 15 degrees, but you had to be looking out of the side windows and the chin windows. If you're looking straight ahead, all you saw was dashboard, there was nothing else to see. Um, just finishing off with some little bits and pieces, uh, that's my favorite um, airplane. Apart from the, the go I had in the Harrier, but if people ask me what's my favourite aeroplane, I've flown it's the Sea Fury. Um, I was lucky enough, being a frustrated jet pilot, as a CAA test pilot, I was responsible for all the historic tests. Uh, I had to test the Vampire a couple of times. Very scary aeroplane, it's made of balsa wood, in my opinion. It balsa wood with a bit of tin on the top of it. Um, you're, there's no crumple zone in front of you. This was testing them to make sure that you could fly them safely without ejection seats. Um, this is me flying the Swiss one at Kemble. Uh, the airfield closed at 6. We faffed around all day to get the engine started. But the airborne at 5.30. At uh, two minutes to go, I'm breaking into the circuit. I've really nailed the timing. I'm coming around final approach, doing my run and break. Nicely, well below the gear limiting speed, selecting the gear down, and it doesn't come down. And that was a bit of a bugger. At two minutes to six, and Kemble was saying, you're going to land. I'm not going to land just yet. Thankfully, there was one aeroplane we were slightly more tired than me, a chipmunk. And um, we did some formation flying, me and the chipmunk. Um, and he was going as fast as he could, and I was going as slow as I could. Uh, and over a period of a few minutes, we got uh, confirmation that I had managed to get three wheels down. And I landed. And that was OK. If you read my book, um, you'll be amazed at the stories of me flying all the gyros. Uh, when, I, when I became fellow of SCTP, uh, I was in a long line of people, three astronauts, a lot of fast jet pilots. Being tailored in alphabetical hours at the end, thankfully I, I submitted a bio that I thought was reasonably humorous and it concluded with, this failure's had loads of engine failures, some people engine failures, including three in one day. And invariably they've been auto charged. Um, engines stop all, all the time, but thankfully I always managed to land them. Uh, that, that was me learning to fly a single seater. There's no power available, there's, there's no margin for anything, they've got no stability to speak of. Um, Challenging. And that's a wasp that I did my final handling test on when I in my name time, which I came through in the CEA. This airplane is one I'll finish this, my story with. Um, this is a deregulated microlight. So it's 350 kilograms or less. It has a slow stall speed, therefore it drops below the radar in terms of, in terms of certification. This was built at Old Salem when uh, the company was based there before they went bust. And I was invited to fly it. It's got a funny little uh, engine in, a Wankel engine in it. And I went off and flew it. And the guy said, actually, we could it really do some help. We we're trying to sell it to the Germans. Would you believe to come back? It was also a little mile away. Uh, he did coffee, he did biscuits. You know, what's not to like? <laughs> so I turned up again. But I, I've been it a couple of times. I said, you know, this flies sideways. There's no direct responsibility in this airplane. Um, you know, aeroplanes, helicopters, ship them up darts, they should go the way they're pointed. This one's from the side of You say, go away and have a sandwich, come back in a couple of hours. What do you mean, come back in a couple of hours? What are you going to do in a couple of hours? You know, it's fundamentally flawed, this airplane. Anyway, two hours later, that's what <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the owner of the airplane was a retired kitchen fitter. There's no, no prizes for working out where we got the MDF. And uh, that's what they bolted on. And I go, hang on a minute. Is this legal? I'd come from Boston there. How long does it take here to get an aeroplane modern? You know, at all. I mean, months and months and months of paperwork, and <coughs> assessment, and blah, blah, blah. And I look at the, the owner, and I say, you happy with this? He's the owner and installer and designer. Go, okay. And then the OEM is the other player that sort of built the uh, design thing, and he's happy. And uh, who else? Well, you're the chief test pilot, head of flight test. Okay, de facto. Well, I'm happy. Let's give it a go. I mean, I have to say it was a treat because 
this is probably what went on in the 20s and 30s, before we invented all the regulations that we now have to suffer. Um, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing regulation out of hand, but it was nice just to go off and test this. And you know what? It really worked. Uh, let's do that. Questions? I'm sorry I've spoken a little bit.